Open up your Bibles, please, to Numbers chapter 12. I am not going to be able to read the whole thing this morning because it's so long, but if you follow along with me, I will refer to certain verses as we go along. Uh, we're going to talk today about one of the saddest stories, uh, one of the most tragic stories in all of Israel's history. When you start tracing the journey of the Israelites from their captivity in Egypt, uh, it does not take very long to see that their complaining, murmuring spirit was a habitual problem for them. Sadly, it was part of a pattern that climaxes right here in chapter 14 at Kadesh Barnea. And I would say that critical failures like this one seldom just appear out of nowhere unannounced. They are usually heralded in by many small occurrences of similar, smaller <coughs> failures. God basically says that in 1422, when he says, they have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it, that after seeing God's remarkable, indisputable power displayed in 10 plagues in Egypt, experiencing it all firsthand, not reading about it, but living through it 10 times, it's hard to believe that they would have the audacity to test him 10 times. At the heart of their complaining was a deep dissatisfaction an underlying discontent with what God was doing for them and with them. And at the heart of that was a basic unbelief that God would not provide for them what they needed, that they did not believe in his promises, and they were not moved by his loving care. They simply did not trust him. Uh, I'm interested in the relationship between grumbling and defiance, two things we see a lot of in these chapters. I would suggest that they are of the same seed, basically. Grumbling is defiance in its infancy, and it doesn't take much for it to grow into full-blown rebellion. We don't usually start out with big, huge failures. We practice them. We grow into them gradually as we spend time in them. And we see in chapters 12, 13, and 14 that fear and defiance, jealousy and defiance have very similar threads. We see it, first of all, coming not just from the people out there that Moses was leading, but coming from the inside, from those closest to him, his own family, his brother and sister. And that must have made it extra painful for Moses. Aaron and Miriam in the opening verses of chapter 12 are clearly opposing Moses. Their defiance is driven by jealousy, mixed I would say with a little dash of fear as well. Fear of missing out is not a new thing. It was present in the garden with Adam and Eve uh, when they feared missing out on some great stuff that the serpent was whispering in their ears. Was God really withholding wonderful things from them? Miriam and Aaron had a little dose of that same fear. They feared not getting their due. They had a good dose of what about me? Aren't I great too? Don't I get credit for everything that I've done? It all started with a conflict about Moses' wife, but it was really about jealousy. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? What about us? Has he not spoken through us also? Jealousy is a strange thing, isn't it? It brings instant misery, instantly. One minute you're happy, uh, and the next minute you hear about someone who's done all these amazing, cool things. She's done this, 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 and this, and suddenly I'm miserable. I was happy two seconds ago, and nothing at all has changed in my life, except that I've compared myself to someone else, and I feel diminished. 
what have I done with my life? What have I accomplished? How many letters do I have after my name? Do I really do anything cool at all? And suddenly I feel less. And the world would tell me that I have low self-esteem and it whispers in my ear that you are valued and you are significant and you are wonderful and all those validation signs that you see all over the place. You can do it, you're great, you're, you're what, whatever, <laughs> whatever. Uh, that we should all just think more highly of ourselves, basically. Uh, I don't buy it because I don't think that my problem and I don't think anyone's problem is the fact that we think too lowly of ourselves. I feel like I'm standing and speaking for the entire human race here. They don't know it, but I am. My problem is not that I think too lowly of myself. My problem is I think too highly of myself. And Miriam and Aaron thought that they deserved all the kudos that Moses got, all the esteem he enjoyed, all the attention, and the special relationship he had with God. And they failed to see and acknowledge all he had sacrificed, all the responsibility he felt, all the burden he bore. They were just mad that he was so special to God and they wanted to be thought of as special in that way too. And when I read those words, I think, how could you possibly criticize God's anointed like that? I get my dander up a little bit when anyone says anything negative about Moses. I know he killed someone, I know, I can read. And I know uh, that he did some not so great things. I know he didn't want to take this mission in the first place. But would you? <laughs> I wouldn't. When they should have been on their knees praising God for Moses because were it not for him, they would have been long dead. Instead, they resented him, and that must have been so painful for him. Uh, but of course it was, because Moses stood in the place that Jesus stands as the mediator, the intercessor. He foreshadowed Jesus, so of course he had a painfully sacrificial life. Life was hard for him, as it was for Jesus. Spiritual jealousy, religious jealousy, is the worst kind. It is devastating to the people of God. I believe that's why God moved so quickly and so definitively to squelch it. And I think that what is at the core of jealousy is the same thing that you often find at the core of fear. And I'm not talking about rational, healthy fear. I'm not talking about the kind of, I'm afraid to put my hand in this fire because it might get burned kind of fear. Some fear is God-given. I am not ever going to say I'm advocating no fear. I'm talking specifically about the kind of fear about being afraid to do what God has explicitly told us to do. And sometimes we can be afraid and do it anyway. And that's real faith. That is real courage when we can look at the hard things of life and say, that is really hard, and go through it anyway. In the face of disappointment, when you don't get what you want, still believing that God is good, that he hasn't abandoned you, that he hears you, he sees you, and trusting in his way. Jealousy and fear both carry a challenge to the way that God does things, this dissatisfaction, the lack of contentment, basically a refusal to acknowledge God as king and creator and distributor of all good gifts. It's a lack of trust. Does God really know what he's doing? Maybe not. Maybe we have to help him. Everything that happens in 12 through 14 is because people thought too highly of themselves and too lowly of God. They did not trust him, and they felt that they needed to take matters into their own hands and set things straight. So let's take a look at what happened when they did that. The Lord had told them explicitly that he was giving them the land of Canaan. 
So 12 spies head off on a reconnaissance mission to gather information about the place and the people. Now, according to Deuteronomy 1, the idea of sending spies into the land first to gain information was originally the people's idea, not God's. But God sanctioned it, and he ordered that men be sent as spies. And it's not insignificant that in chapter 13, verse 22, God tell, they, tells us, rather, that they went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. And do you know what was in Hebron? The graves of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so were the descendants of Anak. The Arabic word means neck. And the ne nearest Hebrew understanding is something like necklace, which may mean a long-necked or tall people. Goliath is believed by many to be a descendant of Anak. So there was the graveside of their spiritual forefathers reminding them that God, in his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had promised to give them that land, reminding them of who they were. And there were also some giants and some fruit. It's interesting, generally, where there are giants, there is also fruit. The bigger the giants, the better the fruit. When we face great challenges, when we encounter the giants of our lives, if we do so, believing God's promises and resting in him, there will be fruit in us. From my own personal experience, I can testify that the harder the thing that I have had to endure and face, the more lasting fruit has resulted from it. So, with the backdrop of Abraham's tomb, God's promise ringing in their ears, the spies return after 40 days with the best grapes that anyone had ever seen. And the report that, yes, indeed, this land is good. It is all that the Lord said it was. But the, the ten spies said, no, sir, we can't take it. There are giants there. And the cities are fortified. The people are huge. The cities are huge. And in their eyes... God was small. But there were two other spies, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb's attitude was positive and optimistic. Verse 30 says, Caleb quieted the people before God. That implies, of course, that they had become agitated and discouraged by this very gloomy report. His attitude was optimistic in spite of the obvious challenges that lay ahead. I mean, he saw the giants. He wasn't stupid. He wasn't blind either. He knew this was not going to be easy. But in spite of all of that, fortified city and giants together, he said, let us go out at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it because the Lord is with us. The other ten said, no, we can't. It's a land that devours its inhabitants, and we seem like grasshoppers in comparison to the giants. It's so interesting that in, verse, uh, in chapter 13, verse 28, they say the people are strong. And then by the end of that chapter, they're saying that they are huge giants, and we look like grasshoppers in comparison. Isn't it interesting how quickly that spirit of despair and exaggeration can move from strong to giants and grasshoppers. Now, of course, a fight erupts in chapter 14 because faith and fear are never friends. They always stand at opposite sides of the argument. The fearful report of the other leaders provided just enough spiritual, I mean psychological angst, rather, to turn the tide in favor of retreat. That defeatist attitude that the other spies had was thick and it was lingering in the air because it had been practiced and perpetuated for some time. Chapter 14, verse 1 says, all the congregation raised a loud cry. Now that was not the first time, was it? And the people wept that night, and all the people of Israel, all, all means all, everyone grumbled against Moses and Aaron. 
Would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Would that we had died in the wilderness. We should put a little bookmark there because that's interesting. Our little ones will become prey. Bookmark that one too. That is also interesting. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Such a telling comment. They didn't want a leader. They wanted an escort back to slavery. They were happier going backwards to the giants that they knew than going forward to face new ones. And in spite of their ridiculous nostalgia, the giants that they had known were much bigger and much more destructive than anything that lay ahead. They were willing to follow as long as it seemed like a good idea to them, as long as they were in control. And it's just very funny, right? Because we do the same thing. We love control. We refuse to follow the all-wise God, and we often choose to turn back to the slavery of our past. Fear and faith are really never friends. They're always in conflict. The Israelites needed only to remember what they had already seen, the Red Sea parting, walking through on dry land, what they had already experienced, the manna that just magically appeared every morning. They needed to remember God's promise to Abraham as they gazed on his grave site. Fear replaced faith, and it smothered it. Fear is often our tallest giant. God told them that he was giving them the land. He told them to take it. This was not some vague, mm, I'm not quite sure what to do here. He was absolutely crystal clear. And he had been with them every single step of the way. And he provided for their every need. He had established credibility, but they still didn't trust him. Sounds maybe a little bit familiar, maybe. How often we need to hear Joshua and Caleb's words in verse 9 of chapter 14. Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people. Their fear was really a manifestation of their rebellion. Joshua and Caleb give this epic speech. You can kind of picture it in a movie in verse 9. He says that the giants, their, their protection is removed. They're bred for us. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And I feel like we've seen this movie before. Remember when the Egyptians are chasing them and they're right up against the Red Sea. And Moses says in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now was not the time for creative problem solving. Now was the time for believing faith in action. But the congregation ignored their arguments and instead they wanted to stone them. And they probably would have stoned them too were it not for the fact that the glory of the Lord appeared and stopped them. And the Lord responded by blaming the people and identifying himself as the target of their contempt and unbelief. He says in verse 11, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs I have done among them? Think about the relationship between unbelief and hatred. If someone doesn't believe you, they don't think well of you. They don't trust you. They think you are either a liar or you lack the ability to make the thing you say will happen, happen. Or you lack the goodness to want it to happen. Or you're just not powerful enough. You're not good enough. Or you're simply unreliable. God takes their unbelief as hatred of him. Now, we don't often associate those two things, hatred and unbelief. But God does. And he threatens in verse 12 to strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. He tells Mo Moses that he'll make a great nation out of him, greater and mightier than them. God is mad because they have essentially spit 
in his face. Now, most leaders, and I would throw myself in the same category, if God said to them, you know what? We're going to start over with you. I'm going to throw some pestilence at them, and we're going to just knock them off the face of the earth, and we're going to start over with you and yours, and we'll make a better, nicer, stronger generation. Uh, most people would have said, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Commence with the pestilence. But not Moses. Again, he appeals to the Lord. He appeals to God's glory as a motive to forgive the Israelites. He never appeals to their merit. And notice he doesn't even say, oh, look, I feel sorry for them. Look at the poor little messed up things. Give them a break. He appeals to God's glory and his glory alone. The nations knew that God identified himself with these people, and if he killed them, what would they say? In verse 16, Moses says, people will say it's because the Lord wasn't able to bring these people into the land that he swore to give them. That's why he killed them. He wasn't strong enough to do it or good enough to want it. Moses is saying, do not give the nations any ammunition to question your motives, your goodness, or your strength. Moses is solely concerned about God's glory. He wants to see God's name remain untarnished in the eyes of the world. And, oh my goodness, if we could pray like that. I wonder what would happen if we prayed like that. I wonder what would happen if we even thought like that. And in this moment, we get a vivid picture of what Jesus has done for us. He is the one who intercedes for us. Without him, we would have to face God's wrath on our own. We have willfully, out of jealousy and out of fear, defied God. Enter Jesus. And he not only prayed for us, he went to the cross for us. And he became the object of God's wrath. He satisfied God's wrath with and in his own body. And he did it for the glory and the sake of the name of the Almighty God. Even after these people essentially spit in God's face, he's still concerned with their safety. In verse 25, it says, God says to them, since the Am Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valley, you better turn back. But from this point on, the Lord would not support them in any attempt to enter the land. He told them to turn back. Interesting that they had voiced a desire to perish in the desert because that is what's going to happen. Interesting that they cried about their little ones becoming prey. Their little ones would be the ones who would live to see the broad and spacious land. The days of exploration were intended to instill faith and not fear in the people, but their contempt of God's word pro proved fatal to themselves. Doesn't it always seem that it's God's word that is in question? Back in the garden, Satan saying, did God really say? God told them to take the land, but his word really meant very little to them. This, uh, these are action-packed chapters. You think it's going to go one way. You think the people rebel, the Lord judges them, and then you think they're going to respond in repentance and there'll be some kind of restoration. But in fact, it goes, people sin, God judges, people sin some more. The defeat at the end of this tragic story reminds us of the words of the Apostle Paul when he draws a distinction between godly sorrow that produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted and the sorrow of the world that produces death. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians 7. 
Instead of allowing their punishment to work repentance in them, their alleged confession of sin in verse 40 merely led them to a stubborn resolve to enter into the land regardless of God's command. They're thinking, I'm just going to go ahead with this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to make this right. They didn't want a leader. They probably never did. They wanted an escort. They wanted to lead themselves. It was not repentance. It was only worldly sorrow. Everyone gets sad when their wrong actions lead them to a bad result, and that's all that this was. There was no learning, no changing, no growing, no transforming, no submitting to God's way. They continued on in spite of Moses' warning that God's judgment could not be altered in this manner, and it would only end in further grief. In verse 41, he says, Why now are you transgressing the command of the Lord when that will not succeed? Do not go up. The Lord is not among you. He is not going up that hill with you. He couldn't have been any plainer. And it's the same old problem that it's always been. They thought too highly of themselves. In verse 44, it says, Neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. The Lord's presence did not go with them. They still had not learned that they only succeed when the Lord is with them. They did not have the spirit that Moses had in his prayer in Exodus 33 after the golden calf incident when he pleaded with the Lord and he said, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and all your people? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Moses understood that without the presence of God, they had nothing, but the people didn't seem to get that. Their actions simply confirmed the rebelliousness of their hearts. One commentator wrote, It's human nature to neglect to serve God when he wills it, and then to attempt to serve God when he forbids it. In verse 44, it says, They presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country. God was not moved by their protests or their action, because the reality was their hearts remained unchanged. They continued on in that same willful disobedience and disregard of God's expressed plan that got them there in the first place. What a big pot of yuck, right? From Miriam and Aaron's, what about us? Aren't we important too? The spies, there's no way we can take this land. Moses is trying to kill us again. Let's appoint some new leaders and head back. We shouldn't have left Egypt in the first place. This was stupid. It is a dangerous thing to ever say, I wish I hadn't followed God. They had no idea what they were saying. Right to don't take the land when God tells us to take the land, but take the land when God tells us not to take the land. And it's all the same seed expressed in slightly different ways. It's defiance and rebellion and an unyieldedness to the plan of the Lord because they really just thought that their way was better and they had to be in control. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul gives a warning to the believers that if they persist in tempting God by their worldliness and spiritual carelessness, they would run the risk of being disqualified as Israel was in this story. Now, Disqualified, not in the sense of being cut off from the mercies of God. They were pardoned. It says that explicitly in these chapters. They were pardoned as a nation. They were still the people of God. But that generation failed in their mission. They missed their incredibly high calling of being the very first human beings, people of God, to enter into the promised land. What a tragedy! And they missed their fruit. So God sent them into the wilderness. Now maybe, maybe this is all a little painful for you because maybe you too have been sent into the wilderness. 
I think all of us have at some point sent, been sent there. May I remind you that God sent Jesus into the wilderness as well, and where Israel failed, he succeeded as the only perfect son. Their time thus far in the wilderness had not been enough for them to learn that they were utterly dependent on the Lord, that they could not function apart from him. So God gave them 40 more years. And as tragic as this story is, it, it was not a detour. It was not an accident. It was purposeful. And it happened for our instruction. The purpose for sending them into the wilderness is found in Deuteronomy 8.16, to humble you and to test you and to do you good in the end. Because it's in the wilderness where we are stripped of all of the pretense of life that leads us toward that dangerous feeling of self-sufficiency. And the test is whether we will be grateful for his presence, his provision, and actually trust him. God placed them in the wilderness for them to repent. At this point, they could not help but see their failure. They had to learn that they were helpless without him. God gives us repentance as a tremendous gift, and we're not half grateful enough for it. And sometimes, time in the wilderness is the best thing that he can give us. This happened for our instruction. So the question, of course, is will we learn from the mistakes of others, from our own mistakes even, because we've done all this? Do we need to continue repeating the same sin over and over and over? God tells us how to live in the wilderness, trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 37. We need only to remember what God has already done. The biggest problem we will ever face has already been remedied on the cross of Christ. We need to let his promises and his track record subdue the fear in our hearts and replace it for, with faith. Let God fight our giants, remembering that the bigger the giants, the better the fruit. And we don't want to miss the fruit. Father, we praise you. We praise you for your presence with us. Let us not for one millisecond take it for granted let us never doubt it. Fill us afresh with your spirit that we might rest in him and move and live and breathe in him and have our being. Help us to remember who you are. Trust in your promises. Replace the fear in our hearts with faith. And let us lean in even if we're scared and do it anyway. In Jesus' name.